Hi there, it's Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com here at this week's episode of The Market Monday. Again, this is not going to be one of those fancy, pantsy edited videos. I'm just going to talk about a subject on this week's episode, uh, give my thoughts on a few picks, and not do any editing, so I, I apologize in advance for the kind of shoddy <laughs> video of this of today's and, and the, the last few weeks of uh, Market Mondays. But I hope this is helpful nonetheless. So this is a topic that I was going to talk about a couple weeks ago and then got interrupted. I actually ended up live streaming uh, this page on my uh, YouTube channel. Funny story about that is my, my dogs came running downstairs. I haven't seen them in a while. Just a little bit of a backstory about them. They're actually my sister's dogs. And then when she gets a little bit too busy or too, they are very overwhelming. Uh, Chloe is a Border Collie Blue Healer mix, and Scout is a, a Lab Pointer mix. And so they are both just extremely hyper dogs. And so a lot of times she gets a little uh, just overwhelmed and she'll pawn them off on me for a week. And when they see me, they go crazy. So I was, I was in the middle of actually recording a video and had this page up and the dogs came running down and Chloe jumped up on my lap and she must have hit the stream live button. And so there was three hours of streaming live with this revisiting standard rotation. So today I'm actually going to talk about it. There will be audio and I'm going to talk about the new standard rotation, how that actually affects the market Monday, kind of, or, or the market, uh, my thoughts on it and how to adjust your spending habits or your, your, uh, your uh, investing habits based on the new rotation. So before we get into it, I want to give a big congratulations to Kevin Mackey for piloting the Scred Red. Uh, Scred Red has kind of been, been a baby of the Rogue Deck Builder brand for quite a while. Morton especially. Morton's kind of what I like to call my, my internet BFF. I actually met uh, Morton uh, through Rogue Deck Builder, through just brewing decks on MT Joe, and then he's been working on that deck forever. And it did seem that Kevin Mackey did run, uh, inadvertently or not, whether he knew about Morton or Rogue Deck Builder, he did tend to run the Rogue Deck Builder list with the Eternal Scourges and kind of the heavier, uh, the bigger control version of Scred. So it did take down a GP, so I think that Scred is the real deal. We saw Morton take it almost to a 2K rating on MTGO, as well as I've had a number of 4-1 finishes with it, and the market's adjusted. Uh, scrying Sheets is just uh, obscene. Koth is going up. Scrying Sheets, I think, is $13 right now. We'll look at that in a second, but it's just that that's always just makes my day when a deck that you know, a pet deck of ours actually does well. It's well deserving. We've been having a lot of success with it. Unfortunately, Morton and I don't play a lot of paper, so a lot of the decks that I brew, I know, I know are never going to be uh, have huge finishes or whatnot, just because there's only a, a, a minority of us uh, out there. And I tend to get actually bored with decks and move on to different decks. So that's that's what's funny. Whenever I get successful with a deck, then that's the end of it, that I move on to something that's not successful because I always have to find the new innovative way. I guess that's just the whole uh, appeal to Rogue Deck Builder in the first place. But anyway, con congratulations, huge shout out to uh, Kevin Mackey for the Scribe Red finish. Um, also, before we get into the Market Monday, a little bit of shameful self-promotion. Uh, this really, really helps the channel. So we have a the problem with I guess this does tie into Market Monday is Wizards has just been releasing a lot of product lately and we don't know if our store is actually going to be able to sell uh, all of the Plane Chase anthologies. So I'm first going to have the excess. So we get we only get 10. Our store gets 10. So I'm going to put half of them uh, up to my patrons first. So if you're a patron, then I'm going to give you first dibs. So I'm going to give you till Wednesday if you're a patron to purchase a Plane Chase anthologies for $15 off uh, through Rogue Deck Builder. And so if you can go to patreon.com slash rogue deck builder and become a patron, any level will have access to pre-order a plain chase anthology. And then after Wednesday, I'm going to have the rest of them. Again, we only have five that are on roguedeckbuilder.com, um, $135 to the fans of Rogue Deck Builder. If you want to pre-order one of those and save some money, I'm glad to oblige. I'm glad to... Uh, uh, be of service. I think that that's something that we're going to try to utilize the store more because I, I want to give back to all the people that supported me over the years, all the people that watch the videos, have donated, have bought a playmat. Uh, we have some cool things out, up and coming with the playmat. We have an interactive map we're going to put on the website that you can kind of sport your, you know, if we, we're going to call it fly your rogue colors with the rogue deck builder playmats. But anyway, uh, that's an, a story for another day. Uh, this is a way of, uh, this, this, Plain Chase was a very, very popular set. There's a lot of money in these, these, uh, 
these in these and stores only get a very limited like we are a tier two store um, we're an advanced store in and we only get 10 so we're not advanced plus which gets the 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 more like they usually get like 30 or 40 probably of these plain chip anthologies we only get 10 of them so these are very very limited so if you want to help support the rogue deck builder of course this this directly goes to supporting like the rogue market videos and whatnot I highly suggest checking out the patreon I'm gonna to try to update the patreon uh, a lot of it I've already kind of we, we, we launched it without quite being ready because a lot of people were ready to already um, uh, basically support and so the patron is still pretty much in its in its early I need to revise it need to get the tiers kind of solidified and we're gonna actually look to uh, getting the sleeves so we can start sending off sleeves to all the patrons as well but that's gonna take a little bit of investment so every little bit helps so if this is something you're looking you're interested in this is gonna be a very very limited print run uh, yeah so after Wednesday I'm gonna give you a link on roguedeckbuilder.com that non-patrons, just fans of the show, can order the remaining uh, if there are any left over. All right, back to the, the rogue market, now that we've gone six minutes of advertising. <laughs> this is the new rotation. So they tried a new rotation with Konza Tarkir after Konza Tarkir with rotating. Basically, blocks became two sets. So a big set, small set, big set, small set. And those blocks would rotate. And it had a huge backlash because people felt that standard rotated too quickly. I, for one, liked the new rotation, or the old rotation, new old the concept arc here because I thought it was a brewer's paradise because the that meant that cards rotated quicker and you would get stuck with boogeyman cards uh, like collected company for less time than they would normally be in a standard run. Well, collected company is a bad example because dragon star here would have fallen on the uh, last part of the block and then it would have rotated anyway within the 16 or 15 months. So that's what the, I have a little bit of issue. I'll link this in the description below. The, this is Revising Standard Rotation by Aaron Forsyth. It's a little bit convoluted, though. I don't think it, it, it's, it's very clear in the article because it, it, it just touts that sets will be uh, last longer, will last longer. Well, just the first set. So your Eldritch Moon and your... your Shadows of Innistrad are going to rotate normally. What's not rotating now is Battle for Zendikar and the Oath of the Gatewatch, which if I would have known that during the Pro Tour, I would have pulled the trigger on Gideon because Gideon was just the dust of the investments. It was down below $20 and was the second most played card uh, in the current format before the Pro Tour, and it was actually one of the breakout cards at the Pro Tour with the UI Flash, and it was just very undervalued, even with a set with high expeditions. Now, since then, Gideon has gone up to $32, $33, and this would be the time you'd start selling out, so you'd make that $12 profit, and so I used to play this game all the time with the, the old uh, rotation. So the old rotation was only once per year, and there was basically eight sets at the height of standard. You have two core sets, and two blocks that were legal at the, the, the very end before rotation. And you'd start a new rotation with, with I believe, six sets, right? You'd have three, no, no, you'd be, have five sets. And now we're going to see the exact same thing. It's going to go from five to eight sets, so it's going to be a small standard into a large standard, or what they call a you know low power into high power standard by the end of rotation, uh, right before the, the last you'll have. Um, so here we'll look at it. So you got to think of, and this is where I think the, the, the article's a little bit misleading, and also we need, to, we need some clear direction from Wizards if they're actually going to have kind of these blocks be working together. So what I don't like about the new standard rotation, and people have already pointed this out, is that say there's cards here in Battle for Zendikar Oath of the Gatewatch that are, Collected Company for example, say, say the Collected Company is holding back 5-drop or 4-drop creatures, which it was, it 100% was in the last, um, before Collector uh, Company rotated out, it was really actually keeping even like Gideon and Archangel Avison down or anything in that four drop slot just because it could not be hit with Collected Company. And so say there was an awesome four drop within Eldritch Moon, for example, and this Coco was just looming over, it's just making it unplayable, 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 because two three drops is always superior to one four drop. And then but you really wanted to see it play in standard. And I'm going to talk about a card which I think is going to be a problem for Amonkhet. This is going to be perfect of this example. So, unfortunately, that card will never see the... What I really liked, what I like to call the Hellrider, the Olivia effect, is when a card rotates out of standard, then all of a sudden, 
uh, there's a powerful card that is no longer being held back by certain strategies or a certain archetype or, or, or a particular card. And let me tell you my experience with when I got into investing in the Magic the Gathering. It was, I really started hitting it hard during Innistrad. So I got back into after like a five year hiatus from Magic the Gathering. Uh, I got back in about Scars of Mirrodin or Mirrodin Besieged and then started investing in Magic cards about Innistrad. And so one of my very first uh, investments that I made bank on was Hellrider and Olivia Voldaren. Well, both of those cards, if anyone remembers playing in the Innistrad days with Scars of Mirrodin, both of those cards were completely unplayable. Hellrider was actually just too slow and had in a in a, a set with like Dismember and Vapor Snag, it was just too easy to deal with Hellrider before it even got any sort of value. And the Delver decks and the Birthing Pod decks were the the kind of the decks of choice. Infect as well were just the the, the very fast tempo based strategies were everywhere. And Hellrider just did not see any play because of it. Olivia Voldaren was the exact same problem that Olivia Voldaren saw very, very little play because it just got snagged back to the hand or dismembered immediately. And four, four, turn four was basically the turn that like Invisible Stalker hooked up to uh, the swords were already starting to get so much advantage or even killing with like the sort of, of uh, War and Peace or the Rune Channer's Pike. It was at that point, it was just too far for any sort of Olivia Voldaren control deck or mid-range deck to come back from. But I identified that these cards were both extremely powerful, and once the Boogeyman cards of Dismember and Vapor Snag and, Del and the, the cards that were enabling Delver a secret type deck were going to rotate out, that we are going to see more of the mid-range type strategy, and Hellrider was perfect at busting through the mid-range type strategy. So I invested all in on Hellriders, bought them at 50 cents, and sold them around like $8.00 is when I sold out of Hellrider. And so I loved rotation for that reason, that the sets would always have their kind of time in the, the sun without the boogeyman sets before them. Now I think that Theros kind of got a bad rap because Theros was kind of sandwiched in between the really, really powerful mechanics of like Supreme Verdict and Uncounterable uh, Board Wipe. And then you had the Boros Charm, War Leader's Helix Burn, and then you also had the insanely powerful uh, mechanics of just the devotion that was actually being enabled by Return to Ravnica type stuff, not mainly Theros stuff. So Theros was more of like a support set. So a lot of the cool cards that I really wanted to see, like Eidolon of Blossoms, for example, existed between two sets that were extremely powerful. Kanza Tarkir with Seed Rhino and Return to Ravnica with Supreme Verdict. Uh, keep really keeping the format in check and making it so a deck like Blossom, uh, like the Eidolon of Blossoms just couldn't really work. And so Theros, I felt, wasn't like a terrible set. It was just sandwiched in between uh, two powerful sets. Now, I think with this rotation, that's even worse because now you have to think of like Shadows of Innistrad and Eldritch Moon as like Born of the Gods and Journey of the Nyx was to Theros. So they're just complementary sets to the set before them. So now this is a block, all the way from Battle for Zendikar to Eldritch Moon. You need to think of a block. And now I don't know if this was just a happy coincidence or if Wizards actually meant this for this to happen, but the Shadows of Innistrad and Eldritch Moon actually feels very congruent, is right the word? It feels like it fits with the overall theme of Battle for Zendikar. Lots of big colorless creatures. They all work together quite well. And it just, it, the synergies were, were where if it was a happy mistake, it was a happy mistake. But it feels like that these should rotate together. Now we get Ulamog and Emrakul out of the set at the same time, which makes Marvel decks a lot uh, worse, of course, because their two favorite targets go away. Uh, but it could allow for, for this, this Kaladesh set to kind of shine without all of these cards. So Gideon and Archangel Avacyn will rotate at the same time. So an investor uh, standpoint, I think that... This is what we need to identify. We need to identify cards out of Kaladash that are currently being held back because they just can't really fit or compete with cards like Archangel Avacyn, Gideon, or Spell Queller uh, Reflector Mage. So that's what this Market Monday will explore. And I'm gonna look. We're gonna look at some of the top decks and see where. And we'll look at the set of Kaladash in as as a whole and see if there are any of those type of cards because where you want to be investing in Kaladesh is after its prime drafting. Uh, so after its height of drafting. So it won't be right now. It'll actually be after A3 Volt because it will still be a 2 of 
in the pre-release. So you get two packs of Kaladesh, I believe, and four packs of A3 Volt, and a one of in the drafts. So every for every two packs of A3 Volt, you can basically think that another Kaladesh is being entered into the system. So that's is when we're going to pull the trigger on Kaladesh, is after the height, right before Amonkhet comes out. That's where we're going to try to identify the Olivia Voldarians and the Hellriders, and that's where you make bank. So unfortunately, though, um, the there is a lot of of cards that really have made a wave out of Kaladesh is very very uh, polarized. You have the 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 decks that use almost exclusively Kaladesh cards, and then you have the decks that ha almost have exclusively non Kaladesh cards. So let's just check that. I'm going to go back to MG Goldfish. I know that I swore it off because of just my um, poor interactions I had with the site. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bury the hatchet with it. Whatever. I I it, it's just I think it hurts the fans more than it hurts anything. I mean we're just we're basically just arguing. Uh, I don't. Know. I think I'm being a little bit petty, but I just not be by using a site that I think is very very just beneficial to the market Monday. Uh, just because it has both economic uh, like market data as well as metagame data, so tournament data all in one. So the site is just above and beyond everything that's, that's like it. You can find bits and pieces on other sites, but you can't find the full package like you can on Goldfish. So I'm going to go back to it. Um, again, I don't really... I still am a little bit peeved about what happened between the two of us, but it, it is what it is. So anyway, let's just identify the big decks. And I this is what I called. A lot of people that are close to me know that I said that, that these two decks would come back with a vengeance, just because how powerful uh, the archetype was. White Blue Flash is basically a collected company without a collected company, because it's still using like the best slots, the one drop, two drop, three drop, four drop, uh, into... This is exactly what a deck would have looked like if collected company wasn't in the format. Uh, collected company, of course, was just more powerful than trying to go Giselle or Archangel Avacyn, because two, three drops was even more powerful than an Archangel Avacyn. Uh, so hitting like even a Duskwatch Recruiter and a Reflector Mage was probably better than hitting an Archangel Avacyn. So, but this is still trying to flash in creatures at the end of turn, and it's just trying everything to be at its slot better than what your opponent's doing. So the two drop Selfless Spirit's the best two drop. So we're just gonna run Selfless Spirit. The three drop Reflector Mage and Spellcaller basically take care of everything, set your opponent back. Uh, it's just gonna blank the aggro and mid range decks, uh, trying to really get established. And then you're going to have the Archangel Avacyn come down and flash in, kill stuff, make his stuff indestructible. It works really well, spell call, or self a spirit to then flip it to make a 6-5. And then you can kind of switch gears and kill your opponent. The only card in Kaladash, which is crazy, the only card is Smuggler's Copter. Out of the entire list, this you have mainly just the Eldritch Moon and the Shadows of Innistrad blocks, or, or sets, really... Uh, pushing this through with Gideon and Smuggler's Copter being just the best cards from their respected blocks. So then we have Stasis Snare as the go-to because it's a flash removal. It's kind of funny that they've completely got rid of Declaration and Stone, which I agree with. Declaration and Stone is just currently pretty bad in a format with flashing cards or cards that get immediate value. You need it to be instant speed. So I think that, that this is going to it show that Kaladesh is actually prime for a lot of like these under the radar cards like Hellrider or Olivia Veldarin were with Innistrad. I don't think that anyone was going to say that Innistrad was a bad set. Innistrad is still one of the most beloved sets of all time and is out of sheer power level. There's still a lot of modern cards that came out of Innistrad. It was a very good set. It's just, Scars of Mirrodin was that much better than then Innistrad, the power level of Scars and Mirrodin block was insanely good with Dismember, Vapor Snags, and cards that were, were making Delver, which was an Innistrad card that went away after Scars and, uh, Scars and Mirrodin kind of uh, rotated. So I think that that's what we're going to look at. This deck is going to completely drop out after rotation, and that is the time to pull the trigger on all of the cards out of Kaladesh and Innistrad, or excuse me, Kaladesh and uh, Aether Revolt that are being held back by this Flash archetype. Now the other big boogeyman, which now beats Blue-White Flash pretty handedly, which is Black Lane Delirium, you'll find the exact same trend. This has like very little cards from Kaladesh. Look at it, it's one of Noxious Gearhulk. That is it. That is being uh, kind of supplemented from the Kaladesh set. So you have Vessel and Sinister Concoction to the Slaughter, Murder, Transgress, Grass, Grapple, Traverse, 
Obnixilis, Liliana, Emrakul, Ishkanah, Kalatas, Tyler's Tracker, Pilgrim's Eye, and Grim Flare. A whopping one Kaladash card in the form of Noxious Gearhulk just because it's a lot, it's something that you can early on get in the graveyard for Delirium and then get it back later later with a uh, grapple of the past. I'm mean, even this this version's running less grapples. Usually, I, I I like the one that runs more grapples because if you you happen to mill your Emrakul or your Ishkana, you can just get it back. But that's usually what it's in in here for. It's 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 the artifact is huge on the Noxious Gearhulk just for the Delirium based strategy. So you need to identify Kaladesh themes that don't care about Delirium or Madness or and right now the energy theme and the vehicle themes is is a a theme that actually does compete with these heavy, heavy delirium or flash-based strategies. And so if I were to invest in cards right now, um, after the height of the drafting, those are probably the type of cards that I would look for. So the first big archetype that really showcases Kaladesh cards is Mardu Vehicles. The problem with this, though, it's already established. So people will already have this on the mind that this is going to be a competitor once the flash and the delirium decks rotate out so this is going to be the only de cards that are not from Kaladesh even the removal in this deck is from Kaladesh is like Gideon and Gideon might just be thrown with the Sky Silver and Consoles flagship or like or the what is the the uh, four drop vehicle uh, the fleet wheel cruiser just might be thrown in that spot uh, just to give this deck kind of more of a vehicles theme and go back to kind of the roots before it started putting in Gideon just because Gideon does very well against the decks that run a lot of more heavy control plus Gideon can just switch gears a it can either be emblem very quickly so if you spread wide with a lot of creatures like the inventor's apprentice early and have other cards out like even the the veteran motorist or you can emblem him and swing in for lethal the turn you cast him or just put out a 2-2 and then start beating down with a 5-5. So Gideon is just more, on, on a sheer power level, probably better than Fleet Wheel Cruiser, and that's why it's got that slot. But speaking of, like, the Cruiser, that'd be a perfect example of a card that you could invest in. I, I don't, don't start investing in Fleet Wheel Cruiser. It was in an intro pack, I believe. Or, no, in the, in the yeah, the Chandra. Chandra versus uh, Nyssa, Planeswalker pack. Uh, so I, I think any card that's in kind of those type of strategies or those type of uh, products is probably not a good investment just because there's just so many out there. But you kind of get the idea. I particularly don't like to take an established one. I like to look at where is the big hole to an existing archetype. What's keeping it back? Or not an existing one, a, a potential archetype. What's keeping it back? And is Flash and Delirium getting out of the format going to allow this deck just to go crazy? So the other one is Energy that we have. We have it in the form of like Aetherworks Marvel. And we also have it in the form of just the green red energy. And this is the one that I think is the most interesting because I think that it, these cards, if you want to talk about value cards, just cards that are good by themselves, then we Bristling Hydra is the card that fits that bill. Again, I think, was Bristling Hydra in an intro pack too? I'm not quite sure if energy was the the uh, part of the Nissa version. I have to check and see those decks. But this deck is very, very solid, but it's just something that is... Spellcaller and Reflector Mage are tough for this deck to really deal with because it takes them off of their tempo. They need to establish that early, like Brawler or Bristling Hydra, and when it gets Reflector Maged or Spellquellered, and then they have to then try to figure out a way to kill Spellcaller before getting beat down by Avacyn. And it's just it's just very messy for UI Flash. I think UI Flash especially is keeping this deck behind. And then you have Green Black Delirium with cards like Kalatas and, and Grass of Darkness that can be very, very tough for this card to kind of push, or this type of deck to push through. In fact, they've a lot of these have, have gone away from the all-out energy strategy with the Uncaged Furies and the Built to Smash type effects, and have just gone into more of, I'm just going to establish a threat each turn that you have to take care of, like the Long Toss long tusk cub the voltaic brawler uh now tyler's tracker the, the virtual so i've seen the the uh converge card that becomes a 6-6 vigilance trample for four mana uh in this deck before and look even they're running like chandra just as like I, i'm an established other establish the threat you you deal with it this really reminds me of the old teamer deck that never really uh had any ground in in the Cal, uh, the the uh, Constar Cure block is because Seedrenner was just a better strategy, and this this again just seems exactly the same history repeating itself. That just blue white does it better than the the teamer based colors are doing this at the moment. So, uh, so 
I guess in the next Market Monday video, I think we've rambled for quite a while. We're approaching 25 minutes with this. Uh, we're going to try to look at, as time goes further on, with uh, as the standard metagame gets more established, I'm going to try to identify some of the cards that are going to be held back and might just be undervalued, uh, that are being held back especially by cards like Gideon, Avacyn, uh, Grim Flayer, uh, Kalitas. So just that little the three, two, three, four. Uh, we're, we're actually after, we'll lose like cards like Fiery Temper that it might be keeping back three toughness. We'll lose cards like the... I think anything that has four converted mana cost gets a lot better uh, or less after Spell Queller and Transgress the Mind uh, go out of the format. Uh, the, they, those type of cards might have a lot more impact. So I'm looking at you, Chandra. That might be a, bit, a good card. But in this specific Market Monday, I don't think that we're going to talk too much about it. So that will be on the horizon. Next week, be looking forward to that. Uh, then lastly, let's just look at Scred. Let's look at Scred and see how well... I can't believe this. That It just takes a GP for spike prices to go up. Scred itself has not gone up. It's a common. Uh, it takes a while for commons to go up. The foil is $12.90. So that's crazy. I guess it's been uh, been expensive for quite a while now. Uh, but Scred, Scred Red, I talked about that early in this video at the, the beginning of the, the Market Monday video. Scred Red took down the GP in Texas and it was kind of the Eternal Scourge list that took it down. Uh, so the, the card that is going up like crazy right now is Scrying Sheets. And the reason why Scrying Sheets is it's Cold Snap. Cold Snap was very, very low printed, a very unpopular set, and you do need two to three of them. I actually run four nowadays just because I think Scrying Sheets is the, the key card against the control matchups, and it's just never a dead card. I think you run plenty of red sources to hit anger on time, so Scrying Sheets usually isn't, isn't uh, you never care if it's in your hand. A lot of times it just turns into Mountain anyway from Blood Moon. Uh, but against those control matchups, Scrying Sheets is, is the key card, and it went up from 6 to $13. So if you have any Scrying Sheets lying around, it might be the time, maybe maybe now Scred Red's going to be a, quote, tier 1 deck, which kind of makes me upset. As you know, I'm a rogue deck builder, so on one, one end of the spectrum, I'm happy that the deck finally got some publicity, and I, I knew it was powerful. We knew that it was a powerful strategy. But at the same time now, I just don't feel like I can play it because it's going to be too mainstream. And I have to play less mainstream decks. That's just that's just who I am. Uh, so maybe I'll just go back to Soul Sisters, start playing that to death. Uh, the problem is Soul Sisters just matches up terribly against Scred Red. But some of the other cards, let's look at Koth, Koth right now. Koth of the Hammer uh, had two printings, one in Scar, Scar's Mirrored and one in. It doesn't look like it's changed too much, but you can see it's starting to go up a little bit the, in the dual deck as well as in the regular Scar's Mirrored in. And Koth is, of course, competing now with Chandra. Chandra, the, the pilot, Kevin Mackey, who took down the GP, said Chandra was, was good all day, that the ult actually did happen quite often. And I agree with him. I tested out Chandra, and I actually like Chandra. You can go check out my, my, my series over at Gathering Magic that I did last week for the Chandra scred. And I, I really like the card. Uh, we mana flooded out terribly in a lot of those games. And I wasn't the best player. Sometimes people forget that commentating while playing is a whole other ball game. And some people are better at it. I tend to be not very good at commentating and, pl and playing, trying to keep the tempo uh, going. Because you gotta, you got to rem remember that you're keeping an audience um, involved. And, and so if like I think a lot of people... A lot of streamers have failed, or even professional players have failed at streaming and commentating on games just because they, they, they can't talk and think at the same time. And I struggle with that because then the misplays happen, and, and I, the lines that I, I, I tend to see when my mouth isn't running get kind of overlooked. Uh, but and, and to be honest, I'm not the best player. I'm not the best pilot of a lot of decks. I'm a brewer first, a player second. I'm a pretty average player. I'm a, I'm the, the six and three at a GP type player, or the day two barely you know squeak by day two pro tour, but you know not do very well on on day two. I, I understand my limitations, and so I think in the hands of the right player, Scred Red has definitely. We saw that with Morton, a much better player than me has just uh, completely taken this deck to really, really uh, successful finishes, 5-0 leagues, 4-1 leagues, very consistently to almost a 2K rating. And so I think that if you're going to invest, these would be my picks. I don't think it's too late to pick up some of the other 
pieces like Hoth of the Hammer. Uh, this did exist when the dual decks didn't have the highest print runs. So it, it was right before that huge influx of players. So I think that it might be smart to pick up Koth. I know Koth is a very uh, casual favorite too. I sell this to a lot of commander players and kitchen player table uh, kitchen table players. Just because Koth is one of those planeswalkers that needs to be has some really relevant abilities by ramping as well as needs to be um, answered immediately if, if it does ult then it's really really hard to come back from that ult so it's going to be a casual kitchen table favorite for 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 a, a while to come i think this scred uh blood moon of course is is already probably reached its height there's not a lot blood moon can do it's like a 60 dollar card it needs a reprint i think for scred to really go up in value i think that the blood moon is going to be act as kind of a gatekeeper just because people don't like to invest in his particular cards and it is a very very uh, necessary evil for the deck a lot of the times that blood moon is just going to win a lot of game ones and i end up siding it out on game two just because people start fetching for just basic lands against jund i actually side it out now just because they go first turn forest uh crack for a forest second turn crack for a swamp and that already does enough damage to them because it just throws off their ability to uh, have the red mana for early lightning bolts or they need to go get another second source for Liliana and the, then I don't have to have a... They, they usually hold up like Abrupt Decay and they continue to hold that up just to, to take care of the Blood Moon and it's already done its job even not even being in the deck. So anywho, that's, those are my two picks. I think that Koth would be the smart investment from Scred or Scred itself. I like Penny Stocks. I like these common cards. I think common cards in Modern can easily hit the $2, uh, $3 range. So finding Screds at $0.35 cents a piece, buying a couple play sets, and then flipping them at $2 sounds like a, a good um, idea. So I'm all in on Scred. I actually invested a couple weeks ago after Morton went... Uh, a almost a 2k rating with it i'm glad that it hit the gp um actually we can't find my scrying sheets zach would you do with them we we i ordered like 16 scrying sheets a couple weeks ago and we can't find them they, we lost them so they they disappeared anywho i hope you enjoyed this market monday video let me know your thoughts on the rotation of standard again i have mixed feelings about it i think that wizards can actually pull this off if they make it so that each of the blocks let's just go back and revisit that really quickly because i think i got off on tangents um if they if they make all the blocks if we start to identify that now this is just one big block and this is journey to nix and this is even worse than journey this is corset so you have to to follow your investing strategies like that you used to with core set and third set out of a block. So it might actually make like Amonkhet be the right set to invest in just because it's, it has the sometimes the sets that have the the lowest shelf life ag end up being the best uh, speculation targets. Uh, so look at Journey and Nyx like Eidolons and the the gods out of Journey and Nyx were able to, to hit a higher price tag just because there was less of them out there. And But the thing is, they'll be dr drafted in two of blocks, not three of blocks like they used to, and then be in standard season in four of blocks instead of uh, the two ofs or three ofs like they were before. So the huge rotations. And I hope that we don't see... I, I said I was going to talk about a specific card, so let me go back to that. I think that the big gatekeeper now... Or not gatekeeper, but the card that might be keeping back other cards from seeing play is going to be the Scrap Heaps... Or not Scrap Heaps Scrounger. is going to be the... Uh, chopper. And I think that the Chopper, if there's a two drop out of Amonkhet, that's what I really, really hope isn't going to unfortunately be outclassed by Chopper for its entire standard livelihood. Like my, my, big, my greatest fear as a brewer is we're going to get some awesome card that I want to brew around that just gets outclassed and isn't good again, good again, good in modern and therefore we'll never see play. And that's just sad to me. That's just like a, I don't know, that's just a tragedy in magic when there's a cool card uh, that unfortunately isn't so it, it suffers from the just didn't work out in a particular standard due to the archetypes and standard but was a powerful card but isn't quite powerful enough for modern and so therefore it's just you know it just dies on the it just collects dust on the shelf uh for its entire livelihood so i'm i'm hoping that they're gonna have to balance the sets a lot more aggressively to make sure that these first sets don't have an extremely powerful card and i think that the powerful cards need to be kind of reserved for this uh the second blocks and we saw that actually happen with uh, with oath and, and um with oh the gate watch and battle for zendikar being outclassed by eldritch moon and and uh innistrad so if that's the case 
uh, with Amonkhet that is going to be more powerful than Kaladesh, then then maybe we won't have uh, we, we won't have that problem with Chopper keeping things back, but I really don't see that happening. I think that the Chopper is going to be a boogeyman in standard until it rotates, and unfortunately it's going to be on the the full two-year uh, allotment, not on the 16-month six, uh, or 15-month uh, like the other sets, like these, these last-end sets. So anyway, I'm off to rambling, so I'm going to cut this video short. I hope you enjoyed this Market Monday video. This has been Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com. Thanks for watching.